Well, good morning again. We are one church in two locations, so hello to everybody in Knoxville. In fact, last uh, Sunday in Knoxville, six people, so six out of those uh, 100 plus people get committed their life to Christ in Knoxville. So let's, let's celebrate with Knoxville today and so thankful for what God is doing there. Man, I'm just so thankful to be your pastor. I'm so thankful that I get to do uh, what I do and uh, really believe that God is working in an unbelievable way right now. And so uh, it's, it's ab- absolutely phenomenal. We're in a series called Who is Jesus? And uh, we are uh, in the Gospel of Luke and working our way through uh, the Gospel of Luke. Today we'll be in chapter 10. Uh, let's start with a show of hands today. Uh, how many of you would uh, admit and, 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 and just confess with your hand that you feel like you are busy? Anybody? Knoxville as well, hands all over the room. Raise your hand if you feel like you are empty, stressed, fatigued, overworked, running on empty, busy. Let me see those hands again. I want you to look around the room and see that there's a lot of hands up uh, so that you feel like you're not alone, right? Uh, Misery loves company, so we're all there with each other. Um, But it seems like we're all busy. And even when you talk to people about how things are going, it always feels like immediately we go to, well, things are just really busy. And then it becomes like a badge of honor. Like, yeah, things are just really busy. Oh, you're busy? Well, I'm just like really super busy. Oh, you're super busy. Well, I'm super, super busy, right? And then it becomes like, who's busier? And uh, it has become a badge of honor in our culture. And uh, you might be addicted to busyness, though, if you've ever said the following phrases. There's just not enough time in the day to get it all done. You might be addicted to busyness if you've ever said something like this. It's just a busy season. We'll get through it. Things will slow down. You might be addicted to busyness if you're saying statements like, this is just really important. It's just really important. These are lies that we tell ourselves, right? You know, if we say there's not enough time in the day to get everything done, we're really just kind of dissing God on that because he's the one that created the 24-hour situation. And so we're, we're, we're not being very honorable to God if we you know, accuse him of not creating the best amount of time in a day. But then we're also kind of lying to ourselves when we say things like it's just a busy season. That's usually what we tell our spouse, you know, to get them off our back. Usually when we say this is just really important, it's just a way for us to feel better about the life that we've chosen to live. It kind of condones the bad behavior. And so we just say, I'm just doing really important things. I'm, some of us are addicted to being busy and, and we believe these lies. In our scripture today, we're going to learn that busy isn't better. Our culture says busy is, is better, but, but the scripture teaches us, and I think you feel this, if you were honest, you would feel like I'm overworked, I'm overstressed, I'm overwhelmed, I'm running on empty. Like we don't want to feel this way. And so when we hear this, busy isn't better, I think we believe it. And if we want to live a life to the fullest, if we want to live a life that is emotionally and spiritually healthy, if we want to experience Jesus in all of his glory, if we want to find peace and and truly know joy, if we want to overcome anxiety in our life, if we want to breathe and enjoy our family and the relationships that God has blessed us with, then you and I have to make the better choice. And the better choice is to prioritize Jesus over busyness. And so in Luke chapter 10, we begin in verse 38 and see the story of Mary and Martha. It starts like this in verse 38. It says, now as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. So she owned this house, uh, most likely pretty wealthy. Uh, Scripture teaches in John that Martha and her brother Lazarus are living with her. So she's, she's legit. Like she's a businesswoman. I think that she is, is a strong leader. Verse 39, and she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she went up to him, Jesus, and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things. But one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. Um, 
several things that we learn in this text. And I, I think one of the first things that we see is the context of this passage is right on the heels of the Good Samaritan. Remember last week, get off your donkey. And so we know that being active and serving is a good thing. Like we should be active, we should be serving. And, 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 and so in this context, right after the Good Samaritan, now Martha is a Good Samaritan and she is serving, she is active. And so I don't want you to hear in this message that being active is a bad thing. Every single one of us have one life to live. We need to make every day count. And so we need to be active. But the real question that determines our motives in our heart is how will you decide what gets done? In other words, what are you giving a priority in your life? Right? And so for Martha, Jesus says that she was distracted. And what is she distracted with? She is distracted with a good thing. She's distracted by much serving. So let's not look at Martha in a bad light today. Like she's like you and me living in the culture that we live in today. She is generous, inviting people into her life. She is hospitable. She is serving everybody. She's got an important man and his whole entourage there. She's generous because she's giving them food and making sure everything is happening really well. Like she is a good person. She's not doing anything evil, but she is distracted. And she's distracted with much serving. And so the first point I would encourage you to think about today is that distractions begin with good intentions. Serving is well-intentioned, right? Everything that we are doing, I think that we are trying to do good in our life starts and begins with good intentions. This is where busyness begins. Serving is a good thing. I get invited to good things all the time, good opportunities. I get opportunities to speak at different places, coach different pastors, counsel people every single week. I get invited to fundraisers for good organizations. These are all good opportunities. But if I say yes to all of these good things, then I'm not gonna be a very good husband, I'm not gonna be a very good leader or pastor, right? I'm not gonna be a very good father. And the same is gonna be true for you. Martha is, is, is trying to do her best here, but she has allowed her good intentions to distract her busyness and she makes the wrong choice. Some of you are making the wrong choice. You are so busy with work or your hobby or little league or so busy building your finances that you are choosing poorly. You are prioritizing the wrong thing in your life. I think a good example of this is a lot of us in here started Little League with good intentions. We want our kids to have a good time, right? And so we start with Little League. You wanted them to have fun and play sports, but somewhere along the way, our culture picked up on that, our good intentions. And now the good intentions are now six days a week. There's practice and a game on the seventh day. And now there's travel sports and people are making millions of dollars off of parents traveling, you know, to these different places to play, you know, in these games, hoping coaches are going to be there from college to selling this dream. But they are making millions off of us. And so now we are so busy in Little League and running around and, and we don't have time to cook our own food, so we're going through fast food, and now our health is terrible, we're eating terrible, which makes us feel worse. We live in a very stressful environment at work. We leave the stress there into a stressful environment on the field or in the, you know, in the gym, whatever sport you're doing. And it's like at some point, we've got to step back and we've got to look 10 years down the road, and we've got to get gut level honest, and we have to ask God this question, God, is this the family, is this gonna produce the family that you want me to, to lead? In 10 years from now, am I, am I gonna look back and be proud of these decisions or will I have regrets? And again, sports are great. All of my kids did it. But it's the priority that we have given to it perhaps that is wrecking your spiritual life. It could be wrecking your marriage. Good intentions, get the ball rolling and somewhere, somehow, Something gets lost. And then suddenly the second thing happens. Distractions then feel like the priority. Now all of a sudden the distraction that is the wrong choice, distracting us from a relationship with Jesus, 
now becomes our priority. This is what's happening in Martha's life. She's distracted and she's making the wrong choice. Think about it. The son of God, God in human flesh is sitting in your living room drinking coffee and you decide the best thing to do right now is to go vacuum the bedroom. When you say it like that, it sounds ridiculous, right? But think about what we do every week, every day, right? The very dangerous thing is happening that when we begin to prioritize the distractions, it can do real damage in our life. When work becomes more important than date night with our spouse, it can do real damage. When hobbies become more important than church and we're not involved, it can do real damage. When you are uh, being busy and in, in putting other things as a priority into your life out, you know, that are greater than developing a relationship with Jesus, it can do real damage in your life. Any multitaskers in the room? I raise my hand. Um, do you know that there are studies, like scientific studies out there that actually prove that it's impossible for the human brain to multitask in the way that we think about it? The brain is designed to only be able to do one thing at a time, to focus on one thing at a time. And so really what multitasking is, it's just switching between a lot of different things. <laughs> and the research is showing, numerous studies show that, that people almost always take longer to complete a task and they make more er errors when they're switching between tasks. And so I think the, uh, the multitasker uh, mentality is really a myth that makes us feel like we're doing a lot, but we're simply not. And I think the result of living this way and living with all of this busyness means that these distractions become your priority and you think that is the most important thing you can do with your time than actually sitting at the feet of Jesus like Mary does and, 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 and developing a relationship with Jesus and growing in that relationship with Jesus and taking time to be with him. The result of this busyness and, and, and if you've ever said this or you're feeling this, then this could be you. If you've ever said or felt like you can't shake the pressure you feel from having too much to do and too little time to do it, then you could be addicted to busyness. If you've ever felt like you are rushing around every day, all day, then you could be addicted. If you feel defensive and easily offended, then that could be a result of the busyness in your life. If you're routinely preoccupied and distracted when you're sitting around the dinner table or when you are trying to have a conversation with someone, it could be a sign. If you're ignoring the pain in your chest, the body aches, right? The, 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 the twitching of the eye that happens and you're like, why is that happening? Well, that's a result of stress. Our body is trying to speak to us and we ignore it. Some of you are smiling because you're like, my eye is twitching and I can't stop it. I'm stressed, I'm busy. Right? These are all physical realities that happen. And so the result of these distractions becoming a priority is number three, busyness creates anxiety. We are the most anxious people uh, in the history of the world, I think. We know that the next generation, I've been talking about this to our students over the last few weeks on Wednesday night. If your students aren't involved, I, I, I wish that you would prioritize that. In fact, this weekend is, is, is their fall retreat. I'm gonna be there for a couple of days with them, pouring into them. Uh, can't wait, love to have your student there, but, but they're the most anxious generation in the history of the world because of Wi-Fi, cell phones, uh, technology uh, that has led to social media, right? And so what we do is we busy ourselves with scrolling. We busy ourselves with some, uh, it's video games. We busy ourselves looking, you know, tirelessly, endlessly on Facebook, to what end? No end. Turning our brain into mush, I guess, I don't know. But the busyness of our life induces anxiety. We are so uptight. Martha is troubled and she is anxious about serving everyone. And Jesus is like, it's not that important. He says, you're distracted. She's complaining to him. And he says, you are so anxious. You are so troubled. Some of you are anxious and you are troubled. And a lot of it is because you care so much about things that aren't that important. Have you ever done that? Have you cared about something that's not that important? We have people over to our house quite a bit. And I don't, I don't know if there's any busier time than the 30 minutes before people come over to your house. Because <laughs> it's like, we got to clean everything, you know. 
And like what my wife expects me to do and what I'm actually doing in that 30 minutes is always the wrong thing. Like she expects me to be like cleaning the baseboards and I'm like cleaning the gutters outside. And she's like, what are you doing? Nobody cares about the gutters, right? But sometimes we do things that don't matter because it feels good. But what that does over time is it does induce anxiety in us. Same is true for Martha. She's troubled, she's anxious. And so she feels like she's doing the right thing, the most important thing, but she's not choosing well. So many of us are so uptight. Our kids gotta make these grades, right? I've gotta get everything done today. I have to, I have to. We put so much pressure on ourselves. I wonder if Martha stayed busy because of some of the trouble in her heart, because of some of the anxiety that was already there. You know, a lot of times we use busyness to cope with some of our internal feelings. If you're anxious or you're hurt or you're offended or maybe there's pain in your past that you haven't dealt with, one of the, one of the things that we do to cope with that is we just stay busy. And if I stay busy, I don't have to think about the guilt or the shame. It is when we slow down, and that, that's why this message is probably one of the scariest things you've ever heard, because if you were to slow down and sit at the feet of Jesus and just be with him in silence with no distractions around you, 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 you would begin to think about things that would cause you know, pressure or anxiety or those old thoughts of, of shame or guilt would creep into your life, but it would be the most healthy thing you could possibly do. Some of us are using busyness to distract us from our problems. And, and that's the source, I think, sometimes of this endless cycle. We're anxious and so we stay busy, but busyness creates anxiety. So it's this endless circle, you know, in our life. I think the anxiety is exposing Martha's heart here. I think it can expose some of that in your heart as well, if you'll allow it. Here's the fourth thing. Busyness creates self-pity and bitterness, right? So in verse 40, she went up to Jesus and she said, Lord, do you not care? <laughs> Do you not see me, Jesus, doing all the important stuff? I'm doing everything. Do you not care about me, Jesus? Do you not care that I'm working my tail off here and Mary is over there sitting by at your feet, enjoying you, listening to you, learning from you, experiencing peace, learning how to be joyful, she's content. She's over there having the time of her life and here I am running around like a crazy person. Do you not care about me? Some of us have said the same thing to God. God, I know exactly what needs to happen. Here's what needs to happen. Why isn't it happening? Do you not care about me? Do you see what I'm doing, Lord? I don't know what the tipping point for Martha was that day. She's running around, she's doing the work, right? She's watching her sister sit there with Jesus. Her blood starts to boil. You felt this. You know how this begins to happen. I don't know what was the tipping point and what agitated her. Maybe she burnt her hand on the pot. Maybe she, you know, burnt the mustard seed pie or a camel spit in her face. I don't know. But something was the tipping point that led her to walk up to Jesus so angry, almost like, can I speak to the manager, please? You know, Jesus, can we have a conversation here? Do you not care about me? I got something to tell you, Jesus. See what I'm doing around here? See y'all, making sure everybody's wine is full, making sure everybody's got food. That's me, Jesus. You see what Mary's doing, right? Sounds ridiculous, but some of us are doing this. Jesus, I cleaned out the gutters, right? And Mary's just sitting here, right? Here's why I'm not Jesus, because if she would have said that to me, I would have said, no, I don't care. I'm about to die on the cross for the sin of humanity. I don't care about putting the dishes in the dishwasher right now, right? This is what I would have said if I was Jesus, but that's why I'm not. He is very loving. He is very caring. He coaches her in this moment, right? I love how he, he really points to the inner uh, and, and most important part, right, of choosing wisely what our priority is gonna be. You see, when you are too busy, you're putting all this pressure on yourself and as that pressure builds up, if you've got to do it at a certain time, you're not resting, there's no Sabbath you know, in your life. Jesus said to, uh, to, to, to work six days and to rest one day. But we don't do that as a culture. And so many of you are, are, are neglecting that practice. Over the summer, we talked about the Sabbath. I encourage you to go back and listen to that message to, 
to clue you in on why rest is so important, right? But some of us have all of this get it done mentality and you can't, you can't rest until the dishes are done, the clothes are folded, every email is returned, every phone call is had, every client gets a text, every opportunity is researched appropriately online. And that way you never rest. And what happens is eventually that turns into self-pity and bitterness right? She is saying, like, do you not see me doing all the work, right? And she's angry and bitter towards her sister, right? Look at what I do for all of you. Nobody cares, right? Nobody appreciates me. What what is that? That's self-pity. And that creeps into our hearts sometimes when you think you're doing more than what your spouse is doing, or you're, you're doing more than what other people at work are doing. And so you'll say things like, my spouse doesn't understand the pressure I feel to take care of this house. Or my my spouse doesn't care about the pressure I feel to provide for this family. My parents don't understand the pressure I feel in school, right? No one understands how hard it is for me. That's self-pity. It turns into bitterness. It turns into Resentment, look at what Martha does next. She actually tells Jesus what to do. Don't you care about me? Tell her then to help me. (laughs) Son of God, lamb that was slain, all hell, King Jesus, here's what you need to do. You need to tell her to get up off her feet and get in here and help me. Can you, she's, she's pretty, pretty uh, in her, like, she's, she's pretty driven right here, right? And you look at this and you think, man, why would she do that? Jesus is there. But how often are we doing the same exact thing? Attempting to tell Jesus what we think he needs to do. Jesus said, you're worried and tr- troubled about many things. What is she troubled and worried about? She's worried about taking care of the house. She's worried about paying for the bills. She's worried about caring for her brother and her sister. She has all these cares and she's trying to manage all these things. These are all worldly things that she is prioritizing right now. And Jesus says, one thing is necessary. Everybody say one thing. Not one thing, Jesus. It's actually many things on my list. Let me share that with you. I've got bills, I need more money, I need more time, I need this person to quit acting crazy in my life, I need this to happen. Jesus, come on, there's many things, there's not one thing. And Jesus says, no, 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 there's one thing that is necessary, right? And it's the main thing, it's the most important choice that you and I could ever make. Jesus said, one thing is needed, right? Many people don't have all the things that we're hoping for, the money and the honor and the success and all all these things. And and they die, and because they have a relationship with Jesus, they get Jesus, right? So, So Jesus points us to the main point here, which is a close relationship with him. So bottom line, choose Jesus over busyness. Choose Jesus and spending time with him over the busyness in your schedule. Give him the priority. Make the better choice. He is the better choice. I love fall in East Tennessee. I mean, the weather as it gets cooler and cooler. Um, I love it, and I can't wait. We've already done it, but I, I love making fires in the backyard and sitting outside, and I could just stare at a fire all night. It's very relaxing as long as my phone is not with me. Um, and so it's peaceful. It's, gr- it's great. But one thing we know about building a, a good fire is that if you stack the wood tightly on top of itself— It will not light, and it certainly will not burn. What you have to do in order to make a good fire is you got to create space in between the logs. And when you create that space in between the logs, oxygen can get in there and feed the flames, and the the fire can build and the fire can grow. The space in between the logs is is the space and what we call margin that you need in your life. When you're lined up, busy every day, all day, there's no margin, there's no space for God to build the fire in your soul. There's no space for him, right? We need margin in our life. Jesus said one thing is necessary to overcome a hurried, busy life, to avoid anxiety and busyness. 
the one thing, the good portion, the, the best thing is sitting at the feet of Jesus, right? It's the best part to worship him, to learn from him, to hear him speak to us, to rest our soul, to rest our minds, to be in his presence. And you have a daily choice. I mean, every day we make this choice, be busy, be rushed, be hurried, and miss the opportunity to be with Jesus. And listen, cultivating this relationship does not happen overnight, right? It takes time, right? It's, it, it takes a lot of time. You cannot rush it. So how do you make the better choice? How do you prioritize Jesus over busyness? Number one, choose to expose the lies. Expose the lies. Expose the lie that you are believing that there's not enough time. That's a lie. There's exactly enough time for you to do what God is calling you to do. Expose the lie that your pace is normal. Sure, it might be normal with all the other people in the world that don't honor and serve Jesus, but is that a normal pace for followers of Jesus? Right? Are you missing church and thinking it's not a big deal to miss because you're prioritizing hobbies and other things? Are you saying, oh, I'm good, I'm good? Right? That's, a good, that's, a, that's a good statement that a lot of people say, I'm, I'm good, I'm good, right? Ignoring all the uh, symptoms that we've talked about today. Maybe you've heard this story of the Mexican fisherman. The story is that an American businessman goes on vacation to Mexico and he uh, is taken out, out fishing by a local Mexican and he, he asks the man how he spends his time. And so the fisherman says, I fish a little in the morning, I catch enough fish for my family, I go back, we cook, we laugh around the fire, and I spend time with my children. And the American businessman goes, that's stupid. Here's a better idea. What you should do is, is actually spend most of your day fishing, and then you can take the surplus of fish and go to the market and sell the fish and you can make more money. And the fisherman says, well, why would I do that? And he says, well, if you make more money, you can hire your friends and then all of you can go out and you can fish, and you can get even more fish. You can sell them for even more money. And the man said, well, why would I do that? He said, well, once you get that money, then you can incorporate in America, and you can create a canning factory, and you can own the entire production process, and then one day you can sell the company for a lot of money. And the fisherman said, well, why would I do that? And he said, well, then you could fish a little in the morning, catch enough fish for your family, and go back, cook, sit around the fire, and spend time with your kids. And the point of the story is that oftentimes, sometimes the place you end up is the place that you started from. Some of you are experiencing today what you prayed for five years ago. And because you haven't been um, worshipful, prayerful, in touch with the Holy Spirit, you, you've just blown right through the blessings that God has given to you because you're looking for more, more. And you might be, you, you might have, and, and you might be experiencing everything that God wants you to experience right here, right now, with what he's blessed you with. How do we expose these lies that we are believing? We expose them with the truth of God's word. We replace lies with God's truth. So if we're making decisions that obviously don't honor God, then we know we're operating from lies. If we're doing things and we're making decisions that's clearly uh, against the word of God, then we know that cannot be what God wants us to do. And so, you know, if we're making decisions that lead us not to be able to be involved in our church family, then we know that's wrong. If we're doing things that we know God says is sin, God, God says is wrong, then we're doing the wrong thing. We've got to have a standard to live by. That standard is the word of God. We have to value the word of God so highly. It is his word that leads to life and it leads to fullness in our life. What lies are you believing today? Secondly, we've got to choose to limit distractions. So choose to limit distractions. What do I need to choose to say no to? Some of us have uh, this to-do list, and it's pretty easy to create the to-do list. I got to do this and do this and do this. But I think some of us need to spend some time creating the stop doing list. 
What do you need to stop doing at work? What do you need to stop doing hobby-wise? What do you need to stop doing in your life to create space to prioritize Jesus and to spend time with him? Maybe that's social media. Maybe it's people who drain you. Maybe that's leave the office at 5, 5.30 every day. Maybe it's less little league. We make decisions based on what God wants us to do. That's the standard. We don't take jobs just because they offer more money. That's the wrong motivation. We don't make this decision because somebody invited our kid to play. We make decisions because we, 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 we look at the word of God. We pray through it. We ask godly mentors and leaders in our life. And then we make decisions. But I think we're just, we just fire off yeses every day. Hey, here's an opportunity. Yes. Hey, would you like to? Yes. <laughs> we say yes to everything. It's time some of you start saying no. Now, when you're limiting distractions, parents of little kids, you cannot limit your kids <laughs> as distractions, right? In fact, your kids are going to teach you more about your relationship with God and about yourself, maybe more so than anyone else. Outside of your spouse, your kids will teach you so much. And so moms, if you're trying to create some space and be with the Lord and you're trying to get rid of the distractions, you don't want anybody to bother you. And then one of your little kids walks in. Don't see that as a distraction. Sometimes God might be actually teaching you in that moment because God will use your kids to teach you all kinds of things. Um, I was uh, outside on my back porch, you know, just enjoying the um, nature. And I go out there quite a bit and just sit in silence and had my Bible, I had my journal and uh, my coffee and I'm listening to the birds and the wind. And you know, sometimes that can be distracting, you know. Um, you know, squirrel runs by or whatever and, and uh, you're distracted. Uh, the other day as I was doing this, um, a, a goose or duck or something, one of those types of birds was flying over our head and, and, you know, that real loud, obnoxious, you know, honk. And my first thought was, man, it's a good thing you don't live in Springfield, Ohio. I'm just saying, but <laughs> just a joke, people. Just a joke. Relax. Chill. Chill. Have fun in church. It's just a dumb joke. Anyway. I was annoyed and it was distracting. And this whole flock, you know, lands in my yard. And my first thought was, I need to go get rid of them. I don't, you know, they're messy and all that stuff. And, and then I was just sitting there. Again, I'm trying to have my quiet time with God. And, and they start eating and they're just doing their thing. I imagine they're eating bugs. And, and God brought a verse to my mind as I'm sitting there. And the verse is familiar where Jesus says, look at the birds of the air. Right? They neither sow nor weep nor gather in barns, but your heavenly Father provides for them. How much more value are you than they? And it hit me like a ton of bricks because I had just been like pouring my heart out to God like about an issue that I was honestly anxious about, overly anxious about, something I'm trying to give to him on the daily. And as I'm laying this down, I'm distracted. And then all of a sudden God uses it to teach me something. And see, my point is that when you create space and time for God to speak to you, guess what? He will. He will. Right? Sometimes it's limiting distractions. Other times it's maybe seeing distractions as teaching moments. Here's the third thing that we need to do, and I'll close with this. We need to choose to sit with Jesus. It's a choice, folks. It is a choice every day that we make. And we've got to make the better choice. Jesus is the better choice. What are you going to do about, about the, the, the spirit that is in you? How are you going to nourish your spirit, overcome anxiety and trouble and chaos in your life? Well, Jesus is the answer. And listen, I wrote this week, like 10 minutes, I was going to close with this spiritual growth plan for you. And I was going to give it to you and I was going to outline it. And then I deleted the whole thing. You know why? because I felt like that's exactly what all the busy type A people want me to do. Give them a list so they can check off and tomorrow morning they can do it all and then they can go to the next thing and say, I did it. And so here's my challenge for you. Would you be willing to give Jesus 30 minutes every day? Maybe an hour, at least 30. Maybe a weekend where you get away, you, your Bible, your journal, get out into nature. We live in one of the most beautiful parts of the, of the world that you can get into nature and be with God. I wonder if you would be willing to do that. Give Jesus an opportunity 
listen, to answer some of the prayers that you've been praying and asking and hoping that he would give to you. But because of your schedule, he's unable to or he, he chooses not to because it's through the craziness and busyness of your life that is preventing him from doing what he wants to do. I wanna ask you to imagine what your life would look like if you created margin space in your schedule. You had some breathing room. You had some time to be with God. Imagine having time for significant relationships in your life. Some of you don't do small group because you're so busy. Some of you do small group, but what would it look like for those of you in a group who you know, okay, Sunday night's our night to get together and, and you're like, oh man, tonight we gotta get together. Ah, why did I sign up for this thing? And oh, do I, I don't really have time to go tonight and got all this stuff I gotta do on Monday. What if instead of that mentality, you, you actually look forward to that time because you've created space to be able to do that? Can you imagine having enough margin and space in your life to actually get to church a little bit early, early enough to get a cup of coffee and have a conversation with someone? Can you imagine having enough margin in your life that when the service is over, you don't have to run out and go do the next thing, but you actually could have a conversation with somebody sitting around you, maybe somebody that's at church by themselves? Maybe instead of running out, you had time to go to the care and prayer room and pray with somebody, have them pray over you, you pray over them. Imagine what your life could look like if, if when you're riding the shuttle bus across the street to create space here for for, for people that are trying to come to our church and so you're, you're, you're parking across the street instead of being upset and waiting on the shuttle bus to come like you were able to just say, okay, well, maybe I could use this opportunity to have conversations with people around me. That's what you could do on Sunday. There are millions of examples of what you could do throughout the week if you created some space and some time to actually be with Jesus, to sit at the feet of Jesus. When you do that consistency, consistently, Here's what will happen in your life. Maybe not after day one, but do it for three weeks and your life will be changed. Three weeks and your life will be changed. Your pace will slow down. Your calendar will look differently. Busyness in your heart will begin to fade. You don't run on empty anymore. You walk in fullness of life. As Christ fills you, now his love within you begins to overflow into the lives around you. Your heart is full. Can you imagine that? Can you see it in your own life? You've got things to do. It is not that everything on your list has to be deleted, but I would say that there are some things that do. Busyness is not better. Make the right choice. Make the best choice. Make the better choice today. And that is knowing Jesus, pursuing him, when trials come your way, when you know Jesus, it will be different. The better choice is being in relationship with him that will satisfy, that will be real. Knowing Jesus means that you will have goodness in the face of adversity. You will have goodness when things are going difficult. Life or death, good times, bad times, when you know him and you are serving him and you are worshiping him daily, life is so much sweeter. I love the final thought here that I'll give to you. Jesus says, the one thing is necessary. And Mary has chosen the good portion. And we know the good portion is Jesus. And lastly, the good portion, knowing Jesus, will not be taken away. Wealthy people, when they die, they will leave all of their property, they will leave all of their money, they will leave their 401k, they will leave all of their toys. They will leave everything behind when they die. You know the one thing that you get to take with you when you die? There's only one thing. And that one thing is your relationship with Jesus. It's the only thing necessary. If you had Jesus, you have everything. And so maybe this week, today, is the opportunity for you, instead of being worried and troubled like Martha, that you would begin to sit at the feet of Jesus and begin to worship Jesus consistently in your life. 
Will you make the better choice this week to be in a relationship with Christ, to enjoy him, to listen to him, to learn from him, to have conversation with him? Knowing him is the best part of life. Knowing him and being with him is the most enjoyable part of our life. And, 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 and instead of running around and staying busy with all of the things that mean nothing, and at the end of the day, when we know him, we get to begin to release that anxiety and bitterness and be like Mary, choose the better part, make the better decision. And, and, and next Sunday, he's gonna continue. He's gonna show us even deeper what it looks like to pursue him personally and worship him personally and what, what prayer actually can do in our life as we try to connect to him. So don't miss next Sunday as we continue uh, on this journey of connecting with Jesus. Let me ask you to bow your heads. How many of you would say, I'll be honest, Trent, this sermon is and was, it felt like it was directly meant for me. It kind of hits me right between the eyes. Show of hands, who, who would say that's you today? Hundreds in the room, both locations. Let me see your hands, right? You can put them down. That's a lot of people. It's a lot of people. Why? Well, because it is a prevalent addiction in our culture. We're all guilty of it from time to time. I wonder if right now you would have the courage to commit to Jesus that things will change. Would you just tell him right now, would you confess the lies that you're believing to him and just tell him right now, just say, God, I confess, I am believing that busyness is better. I wanna turn from that lie and I wanna embrace your truth. Just tell him. Ask him to, to give you the boldness to choose him daily. Would you, would you carve out that 30 minute block this week and every day put it on your calendar and say, this is what I'm gonna do. And you may not even know how to really do it, but it's gonna be you, your Bible, limiting distractions, seeking the Lord. Would you commit that to him today? Put him in his proper place. Choose the better part. Lord Jesus, we ask that in this moment, God, at both locations, we confess our need for more of you. We confess that we are so often like Martha, busying ourselves, distracted. And Jesus, we just want to confess that you're all we need. You're the one thing necessary. Nothing else truly matters at the end of the day. We trust that you're going to do the right thing in every circumstance in our life. So Heavenly Father, would, would you allow our time with you to fill our heart, our spirit? God, we wanna be with you. And so we commit that to you today. Change our heart, change our life, change our busyness. And may we choose you first every day of our life. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for watching this message. We hope you enjoyed it. We post our messages every week right here on our YouTube channel. So make sure you subscribe so you can see the latest videos each week. We'd love to hear your thoughts on this message. So leave us a comment and don't forget to like the video. It really helps us out. As always, be sure to follow us on socials to stay up to date on all that is going on at FC. We'll see you next time.